you got your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Isaiah. Just a, about another month and a half, about another month and a half in, in Isaiah. And then we'll be moving on to something else. I'm not sure what yet, but we will be there. And let me find my verse here. We're in Isaiah 60. You know, as I told the kids, I have a telescope, and I, I love astronomy. When I was in college, getting my undergraduate degree, I had to take a science. Now, I was a business major. Now, what kind of science does a business major take? I'm not going to take advanced biology. I'm not going to take advanced chemistry, though I like chemistry. I had to take something that I thought I would enjoy, especially since I'm paying a whole lot of money for this. So I thought, I will take astronomy. So every, every once a week, we'd go and we would sit in the planetarium at, Saint, at University of St. Francis, and the nun, because it was a nun who was teaching it, very, very, I, this woman was amazing. She was funny, and she was kind, and, and helped so much. But she would show us the constellations, and we would talk about the constellations. By the end of the class, by the end of the, period, uh, the semester, we had to know 100 stars and constellations, but we didn't, all we had were stars. We didn't have the outlines. So we had to actually name 100 of them, and I got them all right. I got 100 of them. I loved astronomy. And it was in that period of time that I decided I'd buy a telescope. I bought an 8-inch telescope. If any of you saw the last solar eclipse, I had it here. And because you can look through it, I have a filter so you can look at the sun. And uh, by the way, next year, we're going to have a full solar eclipse right here. It's going to get dark. Um, down south of Decatur will be even darker. The farther south you go to a certain line, it's going to be, they're going to be long. It's going to be longer. But we will have darkness here next year when we have a full solar eclipse. Just a little side note. Not sure we might do something here, we'll see. I might still bring the telescope because we can still look at it. You can't, do not look at the sun when it's in full, you know, being, going under. You, it'll burn your eyes. It's that, it's that intense. So for years after I graduated and I, I had this, it's, it's very big, it's bulky, it's eight inch around, it's about this long, sits on a tripod that's extremely heavy and I don't like carrying it around. So I don't get it out too often, but whenever I do, I'm totally amazed by what I can see. My favorite thing is to obviously look at is the moon. You look at the moon when it's in partial darkness because along the line of the darkness, you can see the craters. When it's full moon, you can't see anything. You just see white. But when it's partial, you can actually see the craters. No, I cannot see the flag where the astronauts landed or their footprints. You can't see those. Those are covered over. Um, the flag has fallen over by now because of the solar wind. At least that's what they say. <laughs> huh? What? There's solar wind. It comes from the sun. Okay. And, and yeah, that's what it's from. So the amazing thing about it is it's, it's, it's so cool to look at this stuff. I've seen, I've seen the big spot on Jupiter through my telescope. Now, granted, it's not red. It's white. It's colorized. They color the pictures in order to, to enhance them. So it's, you won't see a red spot. It, it's white because it's, it's reflecting the sun's light, and that's the, the color, the light it reflects. Because Jupiter doesn't shine. None of the planets shine. Um, only the stars shine. So when you see a planet, you're seeing the reflection of the sunlight on, off of that planet, just like the moon doesn't shine. It doesn't have its own light. I've seen the rings of, of Saturn. I've looked and saw Saturn tip far enough and I could actually see the spot between the rings. So I've seen the rings of Saturn. I've seen galaxies. And I'm always amazed at God's creation and the solar system. Now I say this today because, you know, we're going to be looking at a, a very, through what's called, I call the prophetic telescope in Isaiah. We're going to see a city. We're going to see a city that, that, that if you and I are followers of Christ, that we were going to, we're going to spend eternity in. It, it is radiant, it's joyful, it's a beautiful place that we're going to be going to. And, and while there are many wonderful things in this world, believe me, God has blessed us greatly with the things of this world. Where we are going is going to outshine those things a thousandfold plus. Now as believers, 
We need to be looking forward to that. You know, it's kind of like when you go on vacation. You look forward to going. The anticipation. We should have anticipation for the place we're going to spend eternity. This is going to be our forever city, a city of hope. Because today, I'm telling you, the world needs hope. And just as we should be sharing with people the dangers of the fires of hell, we should also be sharing them the hope and the glory of the city of Zion that we will all be going to if we are believers. So let's take out our brochure of the city of Zion, which is Isaiah 60. We're going to examine its radiant beauty. Um, I'm not going to make you stand for this one. This is a long, we're going to read the whole chapter. <laughs> so I won't make you stand for this one since we spent a lot of time already standing this morning. But understand that when we read God's word, we should honor it by focusing and keeping our hearts where they need to be. It's funny, the first word is arise. <laughs> arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The nations shall come to your light, the kings of the brightness above your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. The multitude of the camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah will... All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news and the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastland shall hope for me. The ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar their silver and gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. Foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you. For in the wrath I struck you, but in my favor I, shall, I had mercy on you. Your gates shall be open continually day and night. They shall not be shut, that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in possession. Procession. Procession, sorry. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despise you shall bow down to you at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseer's peace and your taskmaster's righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within you, your borders. You shall, you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no, be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous they shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might glor be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your mercy, for the hope we have for what is to come. Help us, Lord, in these trying times when we see the world around us falling apart to keep our eyes firmly planted on the new city that's coming so we can persevere and so that we can share the gospel with those around us so they too will persevere and we will live together in the new city of Zion. We praise you for your word. 
And we praise you for salvation. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Isaiah is looking and he sees this city. Now understand what he is seeing. He is looking at the city and he sees the future Jerusalem. But there is a city that is far beyond that, which is Zion. The new Zion, the new heaven and the new earth that's going to come down. And what he sees is, he sees parts of the Zion that's coming in Jerusalem, and he also sees the one that's in the, in the far future. So as we go through these, you must understand, there are times he's talking about the future of, of Israel, okay? When Israel's going to be rebuilt and after 70 years, when, and when, when Cyrus sends forth a decree... And Ezra comes back, builds a temple, and Nehemiah comes back and builds the walls, up until the time of 70 AD when everything is destroyed again. But there's a bigger city, a better city that's after that. And he's seeing a kind of a, both of those in the distance. But today, we have darkness, but we have a bright hope for tomorrow. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. There was no way around it. It had to be destroyed. God was punishing his people for being wayward. Just as the world we see today, everything we have will be destroyed. Why? Because we have not been living the lives we're supposed to. As humanity. I'm not saying all of us are not living the lives we should. What I'm saying is humanity itself has wandered far away from God. At that time, the city, the Babylonians came in, they, they attacked, they, they raped the, the people, the women, the, they killed, they plundered and pillaged Jerusalem. The temple itself was stripped of all of its gold. The walls were covered in gold. All that gold was stripped off. The Ark of the Covenant we don't know about. There's rumors about where it's at. Some people say it's in Ethiopia. Some people say it's still buried in Jerusalem. Some people say it was destroyed. The reality is it doesn't matter because that's just an item. The people were taken into exile. There was no hope. But like I said last week, God does not condemn without providing hope. Because see, what happened is Israel had placed their hope in themselves and in the false gods. Just as today we place our hope in presidents, in leaders, in ourselves, in our jobs, in what we can do. Their hope should have been on Yahweh, because only God can save. So now they're paying the price of their adultery. Now a small remnant of Israel was going to be saved. They were going to survive in captivity. And some of them would return. In 70 years they were allowed to return and they were allowed to rebuild Jerusalem. You can read this. Read all about this in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And while during that time 42,000 Jews returned under Ezra, and that was a start. I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing the foreshadowing of the future city. Because you see, the real glory of Zion is in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. The real glory of the city of Zion is not its gold, it's not its precious jewels, it's its people who have been redeemed. That is the glory of Zion. Jesus speaks into our sin, he speaks into our human depravity, and even into our death, and he commands us to rise out of the grave and to be glorious. Now, while the city is going to be amazing, it's going to be phenomenal, but better than anything we could ever imagine. First time I went to New York, I was awestruck. It's like, man, this is a, a huge. I didn't like it very well. I don't like being crowded in with all those buildings. In the, at noontime, walking through and not being able to see the sun, you know, and having shade everywhere because the buildings block out so much of it. But it was an amazing place to be. When I first went to the ocean, first saw for the first time, I was totally amazed. That's all going to pale in comparison to this new city. Because the true glory of the future city of Zion is her people who are redeemed by the blood of Christ. Redeemed from their sins. From, from the human depravity that we talked about last week. And from the grave to the glory of Jesus Christ. But even as we look forward to this new city uh, that we're going to actually call home, we know that our current age is an age of darkness. 
Isaiah says, it's right in there, that the darkness is covering the whole earth. And not only is darkness covering the earth, but darkness is covering the people. And it's getting progressively worse. And it's going to get even worse before Christ comes back. But again, within the darkness, Jesus is gathering his people. He's gathering the nations to the light. They're being gathered They're being called. It began when the disciples went out on the day of Pentecost and shared the gospel with all the Jews from all the different nations. And then they went back and they shared the news and the good news. And it started spreading. That was the beginning of the call. It happened when the disciples went out and and started churches. That was the call. People are being called today. People are being called to God. Nobody comes unless God is calling them. Nobody seeks God unless he calls them. The writer of Hebrews tells us that when we trust in Jesus Christ, we come to Mount Zion, this is in Hebrews 12, 22, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal festal gathering. When we become believers, we walk into the city of Zion. It's the the church is the city. The church and the people are the city of Zion now, but not yet. Remember, the glory of the city of Zion are its people who are redeemed. We are, if you're a redeemed believer in Christ, you are the city. You are glorious. We've joined a spiritual culture that changes the world around us. I'm not saying that, I don't don't believe in dominionism, which means that if we would just just be involved in seven specific areas of our culture, and and we would just be Christians and live our lives lives out in those things, that we would change the world, and that we could bring Jesus' coming back. No, because the only reason Jesus comes back is when all the nations have been told. That's one way we could do it. If we go and share the the word of God with every single nation, every nation, tribe, and tongue, Christ will come back. But it's not, by, it's not by us becoming parts of governments and becoming parts of organizations. That's not what does it. It's by one by one telling people about Christ and sharing with them the gospel. And now they're part of, now they're members of the new city. We are no longer here. This is not our home in this planet. It's the place we're just staying. For now, the day is coming where we're going to go back to our real home. Now, the church has made a huge impact and a pushback against the forces of darkness. We know that. And God's going to rise and his glory is going to be seen. See, when when we turn to Christ and and we throw away this false false religiosity that's around us, playing at the gospel, playing at at being a Christian, which isn't true Christianity at all, the world's going to sense a change in us and they're going to be drawn to God with us. In Revelation, we get a, a, a small glimpse of the result of this. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. John sees this vision of all the nations, all the people from all different nations. A multitude so big he can't even count them. What an amazing picture of the result of evangelism and missions. God is gathering his people who have been scattered since the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, they were all together, one language, and he says, no, you're supposed to go out. So he confuses their languages. One person speaks this, another person speaks back this, different language, and they begin to spread out throughout the world. He is now calling them all back. In the book of John, John 11, it says, he did not say this of his own accord, But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. See, the work of Christ and the work of the church is evangelism and missions. That's what we are to be doing. That's our job. Now, we see in verses 5 through 9 that there's going to be prosperity brought into Zion, We have to look at this from two perspectives. The Gentile nations were involved in rebuilding Jerusalem when Ezra and Nehemiah returned. Cyrus and Darius, along with Artaxerxes, provided the funds needed. And at a base level, they did that to rebuild Jerusalem. They paid to rebuild the temple and the walls. 
But the temple was really a disappointment. It wasn't nearly as big as the one that Solomon had built. In fact, the older gentlemen during that time, they wept bitterly because it, it did not have the glory of Solomon's temple. It cannot be compared to the old one. So we know that what, 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 what Isaiah is talking about here is he's talking about the Jerusalem that's going to be rebuilt because we know that the nations and the kings are going to help rebuild it. But we also know that the new Jerusalem will not be built by human hands. Zion will not be built by man but by God himself. In Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Remember, Jesus says, I, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus and his father are building the new city, waiting for his return. For, for God to say, okay, we're done. God the Father to say, we're done. We're finished. Go get your bride. Go get your children. Go get my children now. And it'll be time. We look at this from a spiritual perspective. There's this great wealth and beauty that goes way beyond anything we can see. The nations are building the church of Jesus Christ out of living stones. From all the nations, all the tribes, and the tongues. Because remember what I said. I said, the glory of Zion is what? It's people redeemed by the blood of Christ. So we are, re, we are building the church of Zion, but we're not building it with stones, with, with blocks and, and mortar and, and drywall and paint. We're building it with people. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 5, he says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So whenever we serve God, whenever we do God's will, we are offering spiritual sacrifices. So Isaiah is predicting this amazing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that's going to win people from every nation. The wealth being carried into Zion are going to be the redeemed of Christ. Think about that. When we... When the end comes, when, when Christ comes back and, and the new heavens and the new earth come down, you and I won't have to carry anything with us. We don't have to take luggage. Why? Because it's all there. But when we get there, it's, we're actually going to make the place even more beautiful than it is because we are the redeemed of Christ. Now, within these verses that I read you from Isaiah, Isaiah we've got a couple names that are kind of interesting and kind of odd. The one I struggled with. Nebaioth and Kadar. Who are they? Who are these two names? Because for us, we have no idea, but the people who read this the first time, they knew. Nebaioth and Kadar were the first two sons of Ishmael, according to Genesis 25, 13. Now, Ishmael was, was um, Abraham's son through Hagar, the servant of Sarah, he was in reality the firstborn, but it wasn't the, he wasn't born of the promise. This was them taking action, taking the problem into their own hands and trying to fix it. And Ishmael is born. And Ishmael is the father of the nations, the Arab nations. The descendants of Ishmael are Arabs who live in the, the Arabian boot and the horn of Africa. That's the Arabian boot and the horn of Africa, the green part there. They are Muslim. They're militant against Christianity and Judaism. But here in Isaiah, here's what the, it says. This says they are offering sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus. Muslims. I was doing some research on some studies today. It says they show that 10.2 million Muslims have converted to Christianity since the year 2000. 10.2 million Muslims have converted to Christianity since the year 2000. And that's under the threat of death. Because if you're a Muslim and you become a Christian, your family will disown you or kill you. Your wives and your husbands will divorce you or beat you to death. 
We need to pray for our Muslim brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. But right here in Isaiah, he's predicting that the Muslims are going to bring stuff. They're going to worship God. They're going to become believers in Christ. And we see that happening today. You think God isn't working? I've heard stories of missionaries being in these Muslim nations. And this Muslim man will come over the hill and, and they'll be concerned because they're carrying contraband. They're carrying Bibles. And they'll say, this guy will come and says, um, obviously he's speaking in Arabic, but he'll, he'll say, or Farsi, he'll say, um, I was told to come here by a man named Jesus and that you'll have something for me. God is working. God is fulfilling his prophecy from Isaiah. And as he does this, as he's calling all of us in, as he calls in more and more pe people into Zion, into his home, into his, being part of this, his family, Zion's beauty is increasing. The more riches that flow into Zion, the more beautiful it becomes. Now, obviously, we know that I, Isaiah doesn't realize how far out he's seen. He, he, he sees, you know, he sees to, to the promise that was made that after 70 years, the remnant will return. So he's, he's seen, he's talking about the rebuilding of the Jerusalem walls and the temple by the pagan kings in verse 10. But remember, Zion, Zion's glory is its people. So evangelists and missionaries are building the heavenly Zion, building the people, the glory of the Zion. Each time we share the gospel with someone and they put their trust in Jesus Christ, we're adding to the beauty of Zion. Now we have to understand that Jerusalem was not destroyed by accident or because the Babylonians wanted to do so. Or it, wasn't, it was destroyed because of God's wrath on an idolatrous city and an idolatrous people. And to be honest, we like the Israelites at times as, nation, as a nation, we are storing up wrath for ourselves the multitude of babies that are torn from the womb, the amount of, of treachery and lying and stealing that goes on in the halls of our government, the injustice that is done in our courts, the evil that's done in our neighborhoods, and the evil that's done in our very own homes. We are storing up wrath. We deserve Punishment. But we at once were condemned to death and our destination was hell with burning and weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity. But God in his grace shows us compassion and sends us Christ and gives us grace, builds us up. And it's those of us who've been rescued from the wrath of God and his compassion that he's using to build the city. Now, one of the things he says about the city, that the gates are open for security, and there's going to be security and prosperity. Now, that's in verse 11. We see that the gates of Zion are open and will never be shut. We know this is not referencing the rebuilding of Jerusalem because Jerusalem was built. In fact, if you read Nehemiah, they're building the, they're building the walls. Right? You build the walls of our house with a shovel in one hand, and a sword in the other, because the enemy was going to attack. And they rebuilt all the walls, they rebuilt all the gates, and they'd be able to shut the gates. But that's, it says that the gates are going to always be open. The gates of salvation are open today. In Romans 8, 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The door of salvation has not been closed. That will not happen until Christ comes back. For now the, gates are, the doors are open to salvation to whoever comes, honestly seeking Christ. We also know that in the new Jerusalem that's going to come down, that the gates are never closed. If you look at John's description, each gate is a single pearl. It's huge. It's a huge gate, each one. But we, we see this correlation in Isaiah 60, 19 and in Revelation 21, 23. And I think that's what, that's what Isaiah is seeing without realizing that how much further ahead it is. And Isaiah 21 it says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Remember in Isaiah it said that, the, that they won't need the sun because the sun, they won't need the sun because God will be their sun. They won't, the moon won't set because they won't need the light of the moon. 
because God will be their light. For the glory of God gives it light, and it's the lamp is the Lamb. That's what John sees. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. That darkness that Isaiah talks about at the beginning that's covering the world and covering the people, it's not going to be anymore. It's going to be replaced by the light of Christ. And like darkness of our souls, it's replaced by the light of Christ in our lives. And in verses 19 through 22, he talks about the eternal glory of Zion. We have no doubt that Isaiah is actually talking about the new Jerusalem because we know in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed again this time by the Romans. And while the Israelites in, in 1948, the Jews returned to Israel, they were not able to rebuild the temple. In fact, I would say Jerusalem, the Jews today are mostly a secular nation. They're not the people they were. There's nothing on earth that compared to the new city that will come down from heaven to be our eternal home. And the glory of the city will be God's glory. And Jesus will be the lamp of the glory. And the city will be radiant with his glorious light. You know, today, I was thinking about this as I was writing this. You know, today we struggle at times to be righteous. Not self-righteous, but righteous. We struggle to do the right thing. We trust in Christ for our salvation. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit daily for our sanctification or our growing in Christ. Our transformation into being more like Christ happens sometimes in a very difficult way. It takes a lot of, you know, we really have to focus. We really have to try hard on being more and more like Christ. We have to be, be alert because Satan wants to derail us and while we're here on earth, we're always going to struggle imperfectly to be more like Christ. We're never going to get it all figured out. But in the new city, we will be made righteous. See, because our today is Christ. Our tomorrow is Christ. And our future is going to be Christ. Now, we've, we've looked through time to get a glimpse of our future, but what does it mean for us today? Paul was talking about Abraham in Romans 4. He says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted in him as righteousness. The gospel of Jesus Christ has pulled back the veil and reveal the amazing promises of God. You and I have hope for the new city that we're going to live in. We go back to the first verse of Isaiah 60. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Our future doesn't only hold death, but it holds life. Believe the gospel. Swallow it whole. Grow strong in the Lord. Give him the glory, because now is the day of your revival. As Martin Luther wrote in his song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, he says, and thou this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's the hope we have. And as we take communion, that is the hope we celebrate. 